A private nonprofit, we work to protect land and water resources across the U.S. That includes protecting about 8 million acres in the U.S. in the last 25, 30 years. Uh, and at the Freshwater Institute, we're working on developing practices to allow us to use our water, res our water resources, but not to degrade our water resources. And the Conservation Fund actually has a dual charter. We're unique among most of the NGOs that we have a mission for both conservation, environmental protection, but also for economic development. Because if we go in and we protect the re redwood forests in uh, California, we actually buy the land, we change the standard operating practices for forestry so that we're protecting the wild salmon in the rivers, we're protecting against erosion, but we're allowing for econ economic growth and jobs. It's the same thing in fish farming. How do we increase farm fish production? Because increasing farm fish production in a manner that requires very little water captures almost all the waste, can work within our effluent discharge limits and our siting requirements, allows us to produce fish locally so we can have farm to table options that is either at your seafood counter or at your restaurant. And it's actually a reality. And I'm really not talking a lot about uh, other systems, but land-based systems we have the, the pond production, which I think is applicable in Wisconsin and Minnesota and this region for walleye and yellow perch, but it's definitely challenged by the strong winter. We have flow through systems that produce trout, about 20,000 metric tons per year of trout in the U.S., and I think that's including some of the stocking fish. And that's resources really constrained by competition for other users and a lack of these huge water resources that allow us to raise trout in raceways. So you see our trout production is very stagnant and other than uh, recently there's now about five million pounds a year of rainbow trout steelhead production in land-based closed containment systems, recycle systems. Uh, there's about 12 million pounds right now of steelhead in the Columbia River with Pacific seafood but the raceway production is stagnant or even declining because of the uh, other uses of water that's taking that water away from flow through farms. My focus, I'm a chemical engineer, how do I direct our research on aquacultures because it's all about water treatment. And we started about how are we going to raise fish in a manner that's not just putting a, a hog plant right over a river and dumping all the pollution straight into the river, but how are we going to use just a tiny bit of water so we're not impacting a water resource and then capturing that water so that the system is so clean the fish can thrive, actually have the best water quality and growth of any other systems we typically see. And that's water treatment. So recycle systems are a rapidly growing segment of aquaculture. In fact, uh, as I'll hit, I'll, I'm going to do an overview of Atlantic salmon and, st and some steelhead trout, more focused on salmon. But the salmon industry is producing smolt and post-smolt, those are the juveniles on land, and they're shifting to recycle systems predominantly, massively. And this year and next year, Norway is spending hundreds of millions of dollars on building these systems to produce a larger fish. So that fish can then be stocked in the ocean and have a shorter grow out time. And we talk about sustainability, and the Norwegian in industry is the one I know well, we're doing research with the Norwegians on how do we bring this technology to even more cost effective and efficient for the fish at larger and larger scales so that they can produce more fish on land so that their ocean cycle is shorter because sea lice is so challenging in the ocean. So sustainability means can we do it next year or 10 years or 100 years like we're doing it today or do we have to improve so that we can continue to do it? And the challenges in the ocean in Norway, which they publish about, they're very transparent, are hitting industry so hard that they're willing to put billions of dollars into increasing larger fish production on land in recycle systems so that they can then have a better production cycle in the ocean. So this is growing really fast, not just in the land-based food fish production. So focused on Minnesota, Wisconsin, I mentioned Wisconsin just because we're doing a project there with uh, Brandon at Superior Fresh. We also work closely with Stevens Point and uh, Greg Fisher up at the um, 
NADF. But to me, I see trout and salmon as being ideal species for this climate, this water resource, as well as Arctic char. And it's the land of lakes. It's plentiful fresh water resources, and particularly the groundwater. Once you start going to a land-based closed containment system, recycle systems, your water input's tiny. And accessing a, a groundwater source that's constant temperature, constant water quality, and doesn't contain fish pathogens is huge for biosecurity, because we don't use antibiotics or pesticides because we don't need to, because we keep the obligate fish pathogens out. Another reality in Minnesota, Wisconsin, I just know from Wisconsin for sure, is very strict phosphorus discharge limits. So that's the operating rules of the land. We have to work with that. When we worked on the Superior Fresh project, they designed a system that would allow them to have zero discharge to surface water of any of their production system because you had to hit part per billion levels of phosphorus to have a discharge. So if you're treating the water to the level to discharge it, it's so clean you might as well recycle it. And thanks to the USDA, I should have said this immediately, uh, we've been working on recycle systems as a way to produce fish for over two decades. So it's, we have the technology. The USDA has funded us to look at membrane biological reactors. It's the state-of-the-art wastewater treatment system to treat the waste from the fish farm so that it's as clean as our spring water. And when you do that, you might as well reuse that water. So we can work within the constraints of a stri stringent discharge limit, get permits on use of water, get permits on discharge of water, get permits on siting. And it's working within the system and this technology will do it. If you do it right. Uh, and the temperature in Minnesota, this, this freezing temperature in the winter and the cool summers, this is ideal for salmonids because in a recycle system, the rule of thumb is the water is going to gain three to five Celsius by recycling it. And most of the time you're actually chilling the water. So in this, in this climate you probably will use, if you can, you'll use a little more groundwater to keep it cool so that you don't have to do chilling, but otherwise you're going to be chilling for part of the year. I've got to be careful to keep moving. So to select fish, we look at, is it biologically feasible, is it technically practical, and is it economically viable? Each three of those. And all three of those, all four of those species we've raised, the Freshwater Institute, as well as walleye and yellow perch, all four of those species are excellent, but Atlantic salmon and rainbow trout are by far better because of certain biological um, requirements. And I should, I mean, I should just spend the whole talk right here. I'm not. The eggs have to be available year-round if you want to be competitive because you want to harvest every week. And a salmon farm is going to bring in eggs maybe every three months. You're going to take 24 months from hatch to harvest. And then you're going to harvest for 12 weeks or 13 weeks for three months. Then you have your next cohort come through. And with rainbow trout, you can get eggs every week or every month. And generally, the farms will bring in eggs every week. And then they'll raise those fish to one kilo 11 months later, and they'll be harvesting for that four weeks, four and a half weeks, till the next group is ready to harvest. For walleye and yellow perch, that has to happen. We need to have a brood fish that's selected for farming that spawns two to four times a year. Rapid growth for inventory turnover, that's important. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, certified cast and fray. I wrote it up there, CPF. I'm, I love that we have vets in the room. We have a, a vet epidemiologist from Guelph. Certified pathogen free for what? For the listed blue book pathogens. That's not every pathogen, it's just the listed blue book pathogens. And there's op opportunistic pathogens that we have to be careful with on the farm. And then all female, and I know the that I'm an engineer and the biologist here can explain, but uh, the males mature early. They do devote so much of their energy to their testes. They take the pigment out of their filet. You have a product that's not as marketable and it doesn't grow as fast. These salmonids have to grow fast for inventory turnover. If you were a car dealer and you only sold one car a month, then versus one car a day, you have a lot more 
revenue, if you saw one car a day versus one car a month, if I can turn my systems over every six months, I get two crops a year out of that grow out facility and I've doubled my production versus just, wow, they just take so long. It takes a whole, month, a whole year to get my product out. The cell monitors all handle high densities, especially at larger sizes easily 80 to 120 kilos per cubic meter. That's about 10% of, of the volume is fish. Salmonids are schooling fish. We have our vet is looking at functional welfare issues. The Norwegians and the other scientists are looking at functional welfare issues. The schooling fish seems to do very well there. Uh, these are hardy fish when you don't have obligate pathogens. Um, existing industry in Idaho is battling pathogens. Existing industry in the net pens is battling pathogens because it's an open environment. Here we're closing the environment. They're great at feed conversion. They're the best commercial species I know of that has a low feed conversion rate, about one ton of feed per ton of fish produced. And although they're carnivorous, the nutritionists are so good that we fed walleye, rainbow trout, Atlantic salmon, zero fish meal diets on commercial scale grow out and had fabulous performance equal. So this carnivorous stuff is a, is a false old worry because the nutritionists have overcome that. Fish meal is not required, it's the fish oil that's critical. Um, and you have to have a harvest quality what you're farming that matches consumer expectations. And land-based systems, recycle systems can produce a geosmin or or MIB organic compound that tastes earthy. It tastes like your garden soil. You smell your garden. You don't want that to be on your salmon or trout. So we have standard operating practices and a, a finishing system so that for the last five to 14 days that fish is flushed and has perfect flavor. So it has to be the right harvest size. And for walleye, I think you're actually having a little bit of a challenge because the Fish harvested from lakes are huge. The fish you're going to produce in farming are one pound or two pounds or three pounds. So you've got to make sure your market understands that your fillet is smaller. Uh, you want low maturation. That's something we're avoiding with all female salmon. You want the right everything else. Is it economically viable? Is the technology proven? I it's got to be permittable. We have to work within our laws. Can you get a site permitted? Will it get through the courts if you're, if you're uh, someone has a lawsuit. This environmental and socially acceptable is part of the perception and reality. And is it reliable performing? Are there any environmental challenges? Like in Minnesota, could you survive if the freshwater lake froze over for six months? Would that affect your production? Or diseases, or toxic algae, or super chill? Are there problems that can affect your production? We work a lot. It's so important that all the researchers are consumer and producer facing. Our research is not so we can write a paper. Our research is so that the people can use it. And when we talk to industry, we're learning from industry. You've got to have a strong consumer demand. I'm, I'm not a marketing, but it's got to be strong consumer demand. It's great to have a high market price. It's a realistic capital investment. So we're fighting this in land-based recycle systems because it's twice as expensive as a net pin investment. So your capex is harder to reach. But will it give you a robust internal rate of return? All of these things, you've got to have a strong business plan. We've worked with um, some industry and they've actually spent one to two years picking the right technology for the location and the species and the business plan so that they have an internal rate of return that the investor will accept. Some investors won't accept something in the single digits. <clears throat> and I guess this slide, this slide could really discuss for a long time. It's my quick summary of Atlantic salmon, rainbow trout, arctic char, walleye, and yellow perch. As I'm going to go into, Atlantic salmon has a strong market. You can get eggs available year-round. It's a fast-growing fish in, in freshwater recycle systems. Minnesota, freshwater. You don't need the ocean to raise Atlantic salmon. Great market. Rainbow trout is the pig of aquaculture in my mind. I've heard others call it that. Uh, it is so easy for a salmonid. The eggs are available every week of the year. They're only two to three cents an egg. Uh, they're biosecure, pathogen-free. They're all female already. Um, 
they literally have the lowest production cost of any of the cell monitors we've looked at. You can either raise it to one kilo or half a kilo or three kilos. Uh, Arctic char we've raised and coast salmon, there are niche species. Uh, you can get certified pathogen eggs at least once a year, maybe twice on some of them. But they grow a lot slower. And they're not in the market as well, so to sell those fish, you may have to do more work marketing. And then walleye, I think, has all the marketing you want it in the Midwest. Um, but it's crippled, I'm serious, by the egg supply and the brood stock. I don't want it once a year, I want it four times a year, and I want it from a source that says, this fish has not been in a pond, this fish is pathogen free. Your, your vets will tell you, you don't have an egg laying business in Iowa and bring in fit, uh, hens or eggs that aren't pathogen free. You've got to have great biosecurity. It's pathogen free. I think if someone would develop a broodstock program that spawned four times a year and was breeding, you would have a massive growth in walleye. But they don't grow super fast compared to some of these other fish because they're not bred yet. These things are wild animals. So this is just data at Freshwater Institute, and I'm gonna highlight Atlantic salmon will hit four kilos 24 months from hatch every time we raise them in freshwater. In RAS, we produce 20 tons a year. We put them in the market. We learn so much by being consumer facing, what the consumer wants, what the supplier distributor wants. Um, it grows really slow in the first year, so it takes us 13 to 15 months to get to about one pound or 500 grams. But after 500 grams, it grows 400 grams a month, linearly, every cohort we've raised. We've looked at five different strains. We've looked at densities from 40 kilos max up to 120. They grow 400 grams a month. These fish are amazing. You can get them all year round. They're certified pathogen free. You can get them all females from Iceland now. That's the basis for Superior Fresh right now. Rainbow trout are even better on their germplasm. Uh, the USDA has amazing programs in trout and salmon in the US. And there's breeding programs at commercial industry, a couple of them at the USDA labs. We can get a three kilo fish 17 months from hatch. We can get a one kilo fish 11 months from hatch. And that's the average. That's not the maximum, that's the average. Uh, Arctic char is more challenging. That's real data. It took um, 16 months to get a kilo on average. There may be a sweet spot. Greg Fisher at the NADF has raised them colder as fingerlings and warmed them up and they grew faster later. Uh, our coho salmon wasn't a real commercial trial, but it looks a lot like the Atlantic salmon. The coho, there's been three coho farms in the U.S. that have gone out of business that tried to do this. And they assumed they would hit three kilos in 16 months. No way they couldn't hit three kilos in 16 months. Their bio plan failed. But a coho is a good choice, I think, for a niche market. You do not get the same growth in every system. This is a study done at the USDA lab with us. Uh, we're funded through the U.S. Department of Agriculture as a cooperative agreement. Uh, Beth Cleveland at the USDA did the study with a lot of contributors. Recycle systems produce the fish more than twice as fast as a raceway. There's a lot of environmental factors. I'll talk about some of these tomorrow. This is a, the best germplasm may not perform in the wrong environment. You can make the environment optimum in a, in a RAS. Rainbow trout has uh, a great opportunity to sell as a small fish, like you see most fish are sold at one pound approximately, most likely non-pigmented on the right, or you could have a ruby red one pound fish that produces two fillets that are each about four ounces or it could be a butterfly fillet. Or you could do like uh, Pacific Aquaculture produces 12 million pounds a year in net pens in the Columbia River with a lot of mortality, 30% mortality. Um, and pigment the fillet and sell into the salmon type market. Oncorhynchus is a salmon. Rainbow trout is a Pacific salmon. Or there's uh, two land-based farms in the U.S. that combined are producing about five million pounds a year. One's in New York City, one's in Indiana. They're recycle systems. These are the pigs. Atlantic salmon. I really wanted to you to see that the market here is amazing. The U.S. is consuming almost 500,000 metric tons a year of Atlantic salmon. And look at the growth rate. It's only been maybe six years and we've gone from 300,000 tons 
to 500,000 tons. The consumers love it. It's an easy fish to prepare. It tastes great. Uh, the other thing is we're primarily supplied by Chile, Canada, Norway, and then the USA. 4% of our production is from the US. And it's a great product. So 4%, it's a $2.2 .2 billion Atlantic salmon market in the US. Almost 500 million tons. The world's largest producer is Norway. And I don't have a slide on Norway, and I probably shouldn't go there here because it takes a few minutes. But over 1.1 million tons a year. Globally, 2 million tons a year of, of Atlantic salmon. In the US, in comparison, we produce about 40 million tons a year of poultry, beef, and hogs. 40, about. So yeah, it's a lot bigger than that, but this is a big and growing sector. Norway is terrified that they're losing their advantage because the sea is so challenging, that they are billions in the next five years just in land-based systems. Then they're trying to do billions of dollars in these different types of floating systems that they're trying to produce salmon to. The sea lice problem is so bad that we had one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in Norway that sells drugs to the, to the fish come to us and say, this isn't going to work. We want to build a land-based freshwater facility because the future is going to be on land. I'm like, I know. It's, it's really changing. So that 20,000 metric tons, right now there's three projects I'll mention that could be almost that much production in five years that are starting in the U.S. There's one in Miami, one in Maine, and one in Iowa. And I think there's a, another half dozen that are trying to become better positioned. The price has doubled in the past three years. Do you know salmon is so commonly traded, it's on NASDAQ. This is data off NASDAQ. This is for a head on gutted, HOG. It's not a pig, it's hog, head on gutted. Four to five kilos superior quality salmon that in the last two years has doubled in price. Now this, of course, will cycle. You can see the little cycles here. <coughs> So I'm not saying it's going to keep going, because right now, $8 per kilo. But I will say, and I, I wish I knew, is $8 per kilo landed in the US, or is that in Norway? Because these are Norwegian salmon. Um, it costs $2 per kilo, the next slide, to get that fish from Norway air freighted to the US. $2 per kilo. So there's a lot of room here to produce Atlantic salmon and have an economically viable business. The Norwegians are so transparent. You can see how much drugs they use, how many escapes they have, how many farm fish are in the water. It's fascinating. You just have to use Google Translate. And these are in Norwegian that I've translated to English. We're so lucky. We research with these guys. We have a big project. We've had two projects in the last 10 years. So they share their information and it's easy to get to. But that's about 50% growth in the last four years in the production cost. The production cost has increased. And it's because of things like feed, when the commodity goes up, this was 2015. 2016 is somewhere up here. It's, it's growing just like it was. But it's these other costs. It's the cost to handle sea lice treatments. And it's increased mortalities. And they're not losing, they lose 20% of the fish in the ocean. And it's not, in the old days it was, at the stocking. They would lose them when they were converting to seawater and getting a little bit of disease. Now they're losing big fish as they're treating them for sea lice to fight the sea lice. And it's very expensive to lose big fish. And the production cost is even higher in Chile. It's $4.60 a kilo. They're our largest supplier to the U.S. In Norway it's $3.50. And it's got, that was in 2015. And then you add this $2 per kilo shipping cost, and that's a big margin for U.S. producers. So you can read about Atlantic Sapphire. They're a company in Miami that owns a farm in Denmark, one of the first land-based farms that was not us doing research. And they'll talk about, in these articles, about the breaking ground this week or in the imminent this month, uh, the reasons why they have a, a viable business plan. But the production model is to raise a fish from egg to 100 grams or larger on land, and then you put it in the ocean, or you put it on land, and then you slaughter it humanely and quickly and great quality-wise, and then you pr process it and send it to the market. I just want to highlight, these tanks, does anybody know how big these net pens are? 20,000 cubic meters is an average size net pen, and there's some larger. 
Uh, that's like 140 foot diameter and 56 foot deep. I mean, they're huge. They've stocked 200,000 fish in a net pen because that's Norway's limit. They now have 1,000 cubic meter culture tanks that hold 200,000 smolt at 100 grams that go from here to there. So when they harvest one tank, it goes to a well boat and it goes to one pen. So it simplifies logistics. These tanks typically in the United States are 300, 500 cubic meters now. The big farms are going to be 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. We're doing a lot of work on the hydrodynamics to make sure that that works for mixing and water velocity control. So that's the, I guess, to be an industry in Minnesota, you need hatching. I'd buy my eggs somewhere else. I'd buy them from Iceland. You need the par, smolt production, smolt's 100 gram fish. You need the grow out. You need the processing. You need the humane slaughtering and processing and distribution. And recycle systems I've mentioned are just giant water treatment systems. So if you're, uh, we have some people in the regulatory agencies, a thousand ton farm, which is 2.2 million pounds, requires about 100 million gallons per day of recycled water. About a half a percent of that or less is the amount of makeup water. So you're running on a half million gallons per day or less of makeup water. And if you're in Wisconsin, you make that zero because you can't discharge phosphorus. And it may be the same in Minnesota. But not all states are equal, and there's a lot of states that have watersheds that don't have total maximum daily load on phosphorus, and you can discharge phosphorus. So states like Indiana. So these are giant water treatment systems. They have very small flows. Because you're putting them in a building and you're using a groundwater, there's no fish pathogens. It's shocking. You go into a fish culture facility and you're not fighting ick and you're not fighting ISA and IPN and amoebic gill disease, all these really horrible things. Uh, what we see is a little bit of fungus, saprolignia. Tiny bits. We treat it with a tiny bit of salt. And these systems create a 3 to 5 degrees Celsius temperature rise so that if you're 8 to 10 degrees Celsius groundwater, just like Minnesota and Wisconsin, hey, you're 11 to 15. That's ideal temperatures for Arctic char, rainbow trout, Atlantic salmon, and coho salmon. But you still need a little chilling. And this is just to show you that we've raised since 2009 at least seven cohorts of Atlantic salmon. And although they have different performance between 100 grams and 500 grams, that spreads out when they're harvested. They always grow at 400 grams a month on average. In fresh water, so you don't need the ocean to raise the fish. So here's a huge advantage. When I talk to others at the Freshwater Institute, we said, how are we going to make this easier for farmers? And he's like, we've got to reduce the capital cost. Okay. The easiest way for me to reduce the capital cost is to say raise in fresh water, not salt water. Raised in Minnesota, where you have freshwater resources, it's very hard to find a sea site. The land's more expensive on the ocean. There's a lot more permits on the ocean, although the effluent discharge could be easier. But in the system, oxygen in the water is not held as readily in, in seawater as freshwater, so you have to have more flow to provide the oxygen. CO2 removal efficiency is 20 to 40 percent reduced, so you need more water and so forth. And there's other toxic problems, potentials. And actually, full string seawater is not as good for Atlantic salmon as 10 to 12 part per thousand. So raise it in fresh water. You've just saved yourself 25% of your investment cost. And that's assuming you could find a site on the land. It took five years, but with our USD funding, we finally published a really good economics and carbon footprint paper on land-based salmon farming versus ocean pen farming. We worked with Centef in Norway to cover the cost and, and footprint of Norwegian production of salmon. The production costs are the same, approximately, and Norway's are continuing to go up. The problem is the investment cost is greater. It's 80 percent higher in a land-based system or so than in a net pen in Norway. So to get a return on investment, you don't have as good a return on investment, even with a 30% premium, because Norwegian net pins are so cheap to produce fish. But we can produce these in the U.S. and have a local production, a local product. And the gap is narrowing because we're making lots of innovations, as we'll talk about a little bit. So recycle systems 
are my favorite because we have permitted discharges. They're a point source discharge. Some people go into infiltration basins. This is right on near the ocean, so that's actually going down into a saltwater aquifer that nobody drinks. They can have infiltration. We have a permitted discharge at the Freshwater Institute that's going into Chesapeake Bay watershed that's extremely regulated on nutrients. You can reclaim the nutrients. So instead of feeding fish and producing fecal matter that then floats away into the environment where we don't really need the nitrogen and phosphorus, we capture the manure because we have to. We've got to keep the water clean. And then to get rid of it, you can't just pump off billions of gallons of water. You've got to thicken it, get into a biosolid. You put the biosolid as a soil amendment on land, you're reclaiming the nitrogen and phosphorus for agriculture. Uh, Brandon's raising alfalfa with his irrigation pond. Uh, you can compost it, or you can even go to aquaponics, like Urban Organics here, or Superior Fresh. And it produces healthier fish. We, the last three cohorts, I think we've lost two or three percent of our fish during grow out. That's the final year when there are 90 percent of their biomass is put onto the fish. We have less mortality, improved health and performance because they're not fighting sea lice. They don't have uh, viruses, amoeba, bacteria. They don't have toxic algae or super chill. It's the ideal condition. They're not fleeing marine mammals. They're not hunting. The food comes to them. 24 hour light, a salmon thinks it's north of the Arctic Circle and it's summer. They grow best in the summer, 24 hour lights. We only give them a six week winter and that's just photo period short day length when they're about 40 grams to make them think that they went through winter to grow faster. So we don't ever use antibiotics. There's a dozen commercial farms raising Atlantic salmon to market size. One of them got in a uh, bacteria, frunculosis. They used antibiotics and they said, heck with this. They shut down, put in better technology to screen their seawater that they were pumping in. They haven't had any since. They don't use antibiotics if they can. No, we don't have sea lice. We don't feed pesticides. Uh, Atlantic salmon are ranked best choice by the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which is a rigorous ranking on sustainability. It's local and fresh. It's highly traceable, consistent production, the same product every week. These are all marketing attributes that help you when you sell your fish. Never feed pesticides. Really, antibiotics are hardly used in aquaculture in salmon production, except for in Chile where they have rickettsia. But in Norway and North America, it's just not used. Um, it's very environmentally friendly. So now there's a dozen farms globally. What, you, what I find horrible, and I've got to finish up right away, uh, four of them are in Canada. Five of them are in Europe, two of them, or six in Europe, two of them in China. Why aren't they in the U.S.? It's the market. Well, the th three or four of them in Europe receive subsidies from the government to build a facility. So the one in Poland received 60% of the capital from the government. The two of them in Denmark received 30 to 40% of the capital from the government. The people wanting to build these in the U.S. are stumbling into, well, it's not proven yet, so it's hard for me to raise 10 million or 100 million or more for these projects. Uh, the one, number one up there, Katera, was a pilot project paid for by uh, nonprofits and government funding, about $9 million at a First Nation tribe. 400 metric tons. So if you see small production, Freshwater Institute, we were the pioneers. We started selling fish in 2012 to test the market. Uh, Superior Fresh, 2018, the first U.S. farm. Uh, the big farms, they had, these guys had subsidies from the Europe EU. You that. Yeah, I'll finish. Uh, and I'll, I'll use this as my, well, let me go to my conclusion. Superior Fresh is three acres under glass for hydroponics. It has zero surface water discharge of the first Atlantic salmon farm in the, in the country that's uh, going to produce Atlantic salmon, and they're probably the li largest leafy green producer. At the, the conclusion. So um, there's, this is a farm fish desert. If there's a great NOAA graphic that shows where we produce our fish in the U.S., there's nothing here. I know there's a little bit, but it doesn't make the NOAA graph. Uh, there are huge freshwater resources at the ideal temperature. This is the breadbasket of the U.S. I mean, you've got all kinds of animal protein byproducts. You've got all kinds of grains. Uh, you don't need fish meal. It's a great place. The, the challenges are you have to be able to discharge 
the water and you have to meet that discharge limit or you have to close it down so you don't. Um, there's a huge market upsize in Atlantic salmon. It's technically, biologically, and economically viable, we think. Um, there's been a lot of investment which is reducing the production costs, making it more efficient. Uh, that's reducing the capex and the opex and that's because there's improvements in technology and design as we get better at this. Uh, it's standardiza standardization in equipment and in construction methods and there's economy of scale. Uh, we need more research. There's some key groups doing that research. And that, that would do it. I'm going to just show the last slide. We hold an aquaculture innovation workshop every year that brings in stakeholders from industry with academics that focuses on large recycle systems for um, salmon and trout primarily. Uh, we probably will involve shrimp as we see it's actually a larger industry growing. And this one next is in Vancouver in November. Thank you.